Hi, my name is Christina Grozik and I'm with Going Ohm Collective and also with a documentary project called Going Ohm and it is an exploration into the world of sound and we really hope that it will inspire folks to consider how they use sound in their world. So if you want to check out more on the film, you can always check out the website goingohmfilm.com. All the platforms are available there. So to keep the discussion going about sound because it's such an important topic, We've decided to talk with different people about how they use it and why that matters. And today I am so excited to welcome Alexander Lieberman. Hello, Alexander. It's good to see you again. Hi. <laughs> how are you? Well, very good. Thank you. Good. I am doing great. Yeah, it's really nice to connect with you again. And where are you these days? Right now I'm in the south of France, uh, outside of Nice. Yeah, that where I'm originally good. from. Yeah. That's where you're originally from, yeah. And you yeah. split some time, like um, with Germany and New York. I understand too. Yeah, exactly. My father's German, my mom's French, so I had to deal with that dichotomy my entire life. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, it sounds like a lovely place to spend time for sure. Yeah, so, it is. Yeah, and we we connected in a very interesting way. So a friend of mine had sent me some of your work. And when they sent it to me, I was just blown away by it. I couldn't stop watching it. I've probably seen that video at least like 30 to 50 times at least. Um, and I think about 10 of them were just in the first day they sent it to me. So what it was, it was a collage of different animal sounds. So we had birds in there, we had penguins, there were whales and wolves, right? And I noticed, and I mean, while well, they had these amazing, beautiful voices and you could hear their voice and their song, which is miraculous within itself, underneath there was a scroll of different music and you had transcribed the sounds of these creatures below it. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. And I'm like, oh, I want to learn why he does this. You know, I thought it was extraordinary, but I wanted to understand why you were doing it. So I reached out. So it was really good to connect with you because I know anyone that's taken a workshop with me or a class, they know that I always say nature is some our, our greatest teachers. So I really think there's so much we can learn and I understand that you learn from them too. So I want to get into that in a little bit, but you know, how does one become a composer? Like, was this something as a child that you're like, you know, when I'm older, I want to be a composer. Like how did your journey with sound and where you are right now take form? Um, well, Basically, um, well, first, thank you. <laughs> thank you for this introduction. It was very nice. And I'm very happy to be here, too. Um, so first, I have to say that I'm, I'm, I grew up in a you know, musical household. My father is a musician. My grandfather was a musician. My two brothers who came after me are musicians, too. My mom is a, a music lover, and aficionado of opera. She, uh, she knows, I think, so many lyrics by heart, it's crazy. Um, so, you know, my father was a violinist, so normally I pick up the violin at, at age two, as one does. Uh, that's when I started playing the violin. And uh, yeah, so I, you know, when I was 16, I switched to, to the viola um, and also started playing piano. And that is also the time I started composing, like around 15, 16. And it mostly came from film music. Um, I was, you know, it's, it's the time of um, Star Wars, of uh, Ennio Morricone, the big movies, you know, and uh, I just thought this music is so cool and I really felt it. And I, I just went to the piano and tried to imitate it and to play it. And that's how I came up with my own ideas. And then I said like, that is what I want to do. And uh, it really came, I mean, there was a catalyst there, um, and that was really the film music of uh, The Mission, I remember, by Ennio Morricone. And that's when I said, like, wow, that's, that's what I want to do. So first was really film music, but then I kind of went into more the classical music scene. And uh, yeah, and then I guess uh, I just kept writing. Yeah. So what was it about the film you just um, referred to, The Mission, that really struck you? Um, the thing is with film music, it's always the, the mixture with the images. And there I thought it was really like the perfect music that accompanied it, you know? And then I was like, um, of course the, mu the, the movie is brilliant. So it, 
that's that was really important too so then i yeah i just listened to it over and over again and i i think i wanted to understand why uh what i felt you know that's music is such a mysterious art form and you like um there are some elements that make you feel a certain way and uh you learn this peu a peu when you like go to music school what kind of tribes make you feel what what kind of um so it's like kind of uh how do you say like yeah you have a palette of emotions that are sometimes uh created through some chords or something so of course it's much more complicated than that but basically i wanted to understand how it works yeah yeah, I love that. And, you know, I think that's so, so true. It's, you know, music moves us. It's an emotional experience, right? For sure. And um, not too long ago, I spoke with Ivan Reitman, who is a producer director. He's, he's noted for Ghostbusters and all these other films. And we were talking about if you changed in a scene, a sound or the music, oh, yeah. how different the whole scene would be. It would take on a completely different meaning. So it's what really kind of is the foundation to build where we are and how we experience something, right? So yeah, it's so powerful. So as a composer, what is what is the process that you go through as a composer and how important is the art of listening to being a composer? Okay, wow, well, um, two questions in one. So uh, the approach of composing, I, I mean, different composers have different approaches to how to, you know, how to compose. Um, I have, I'm still searching for mine, to be honest, but um, the way I start is basically always by having the form laid out already in the beginning. So this is for concert music, okay? So it's not like for film music, um, but basically I know a piece is gonna be like seven minutes long uh, for that instrumentation. And um, then I, I basically light it up. Okay, I have seven minutes. I'm gonna have one minute of this formally. I, you know, I have processes going on. I know what's happening when and where. And of course I can break those patterns, but basically it is a guideline, a blueprint um, of, of, of what I'm gonna do. It's like, if you want, it's like, um, yeah, it's like a blueprint, like architecture, you know? And then I just fill in the notes basically, but um, of course, the music themes or the what I'm gonna use, that's always the most difficult thing. I think the the beginning to start a piece and to end it are the most complicated things. Once you have the machine, you know, the everything rolling, then it's fine. You can be creative. But uh starting and ending are the, the toughest things for me at least. Um yeah, and listening, I mean. Um listening is I don't know, it's like important of course you know it's it goes without saying but um um i think when you um that's always the question when you know or understand what's also happening or why is something goes on it's it can um, enhance the experience too um, but this is a different question but basically um yeah listening to music is i mean listening attentive listening is extremely important and i noticed this from friends too like when they when they notice small or subtle details that I implemented in my music, then I'm just like always surprised. Wow, you know, you notice like a minor detail, and then I'm um, that can be a changing experience, like a, a really, um, yeah, it can be an extremely small detail that makes every, you know, everything coherent sometimes. Um, I hope that makes sense. It totally makes sense. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it absolutely makes sense. So it's it's kind of like that beginning and the end in the middle, right? You're taking us through a journey. It's a journey. So how do you keep someone's, if, if we're talking about like maybe a seven minute piece, how do you keep someone's attention? Are there certain techniques or tips that you use to keep the attention throughout the seven minutes? Wow, those questions are great. Um, so. Yes, I mean, basically, I'm coming back to the form. So I have, um, when I outline the form, I I kind of know how seven minutes feel like, and I know how I'm going to divide my piece so that, you know, um, the timing is always important. And actually, that makes the great composers when you listen to a symphony by Beethoven, for example, you're like, now it will start to become boring. And that's the moment something changes. And I think um, all the great composers have that in common. Like, the timing is always right. Um, a second theme's coming just when it needs to, um, 
a detail or uh, something that jumps out of the context comes and that gets your attention. So it's really a game, basically, if you want, of seeking somebody's attention um, while still being like um, coherent in, in the total form, if that makes sense, right? So you, 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 you have a, a timeline and you know, okay, I'm going to play with these. I'm going to have my first theme. Let's pretend or I'm going to base my piece around the tone A. But you cannot listen to the tone A for a while. So something must happen, you know, but what, at what moments? And um, you also don't want to overdo it. So <laughs> if you want, it's almost like cooking, right? You have to put the right ingredient at the right moment uh, at the time. And then time is really important, really important. So actually, that's a good yeah, analogy with the cooking. That's a great analogy. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like fantastic. That. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a keeper for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So because I mean the same the same goes with the work I do with the sound healing relaxation sessions is I, you know, will switch it so it doesn't yeah. get like to that point where it's like, oh, you know. So but what how do you know? Is it like an intuitive kind of process that you go through to know when you need to switch it up, right? When it's time to switch directions. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's mostly intuition. Sometimes I'm basing my forms also with a, a golden ratio. Um, sometimes, I mean, some composers swear much more crazy about it. It's like Bartok, you know, for him, uh, everything was meticulously written out. The piece is like 11 minutes, 34 seconds or this section, and he writes it exactly how he wants and uh, one knows that for him the golden ratio was like really important too um but i think you know when you do it intuitively often it comes back more or less to the golden ratio too um if it's you know well done i guess like um but yeah sometimes otherwise it's mostly intuitively you know i would conduct and imagine the piece in front of me or like listen to it and then be like now at that moment something needs to happen um now I'm getting a little bit annoyed by the length of it. So now, um, so yeah, for me, it's mostly intuitive. And then with the golden ratio for someone that's not familiar with that, how would you describe that? Uh, well, basically the golden ratio is found everywhere uh, in nature. If you take the Fibonacci series, you know, um, if you divide the next number by the previous one, you have, um, it always, gets closer and closer to the golden ratio, which is a proportion. So basically in the beginning, uh, three divided by two is 1.6 something. If you go on the ratio, it's five divided by three, it's 1.61 something. Um, but basically it's, um, um, it's a number that reflects a ratio. So for example, in photography, it is used a lot. Like for example, if you see me on the screen right now, a photograph, a professional photograph would probably put me here, you see, and it creates this kind of, I'm here at like, <laughs> this is three. Oh, like three, like, and five, you know, like, so you have a proportion. And um, yeah, so it's aesthetics, but basically everything, every flower in nature, every, you know, this, this proportion of my finger, this phalanche here to the next one is in the gold ratio to that one, to that one, to the elbow. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was, you described that beautifully. So I know before we officially started our discussion, we were talking about how interconnected everything is and it blows me away when you see the comparison in nature to other things like our thumbprint and like a tree stump when they cut yeah. it and you can see like the correlations between nature and us everything's connected so it's really it's interesting so i love that you just defined that for us so thank you for describing that yeah of course <laughs> yeah. yeah so with your work what inspires you um Generally, or now with the, I mean, what inspires me? I'm inspired by so many things. Like um, it can be science, it can be books, it can be literature, it can be, uh, yeah, I mean, the list is endless. But if I look at my last uh, pieces, um, then I've been like very inspired by uh, history, philosophy, um, uh, yeah, even um, by some. Um, yeah, it's poetry um, and science. Like I've, 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 I wrote a piece about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for, for percussion solo. I've uh, written a piece about um, Elizabeth Colbert's, uh, Colbert's Pulitzer Prize winning book, 
uh, the sixth extinction. Um, so yeah, a lot of lots of different fields, and that is personally one of the things that is very dear to me. It's like um, to always implement something other than just music in my in my music because. I can just continue to learn, you know, I dive into a subject and I just learn so much, like so, so, so much. And um, I wasn't the most studious, um, you know, kid in school and stuff, because once I'm forced to learn things, I kind of have this kind of repulsion to learning. But once I, went, you know, I left school, um, speaking of high school, suddenly I was just like, I want to read everything. I want to learn everything. And now I think through music, I'm doing that. Um, so biology, you know, you name it, everything. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I wrote a piece on placozoa. So they are the smallest free living animals, a simple, the simplest free living animals that are made of six cell types only. And it's a very niche subject. But uh, one of my friends is doing his uh, PhD on them, so I collaborated with him, and now I, I know I, I, I had a motif for every cell type and stuff in the piece, and I mean now I know more about Placozoa than, <laughs> than I should probably, but um, I just learn and learn. So, and uh, yeah, that's a re mo mostly recent thing. I I started to do that I think like five, six years, seven years ago. I started to. Uh, noticed that I just enjoyed so much. Alexander, I apps, I love that so much. I love it so much. And like, as you were describing it, I'm envisioning walking down a hallway and there's these screens on the side that are showing the different cells with your music playing to each of them. And as you continue the journey, it's like this all around experience, this immersion into yeah. the visual aspect of these cells and your music bringing it to life and then the creature comes together at the end you know i love i love love that so yeah but, but you know like this is um this is a problem we have as a human species species generally like um we get so specialized so everyone who's gonna listen is gonna be like yeah it's true you know like your field you become an expert in your field or what you're doing but then um you don't know actually how close other things are too sometimes and uh I'm, you know, every time I work with different things, I'm like, wow, this is so close to something else. I see, you know, this is so, you know, this can help uh, another field. Um, I don't know, like the, um, as you say, you know, like, as you said, it's like also interconnected. And um, even in the fields, you know, they can like, I don't know, even like I had a friend who is a doctor and he said that slowly they're now trying to have um, uh, patients, you know, um, the data from patients, like, um, transcribed into music because then acoustically um, they can see like they go can go over years of data within a minute or like two and know exactly when something is different I love just that. think about it you know then you're just like wow actually music um, if it's music or if you consider it being music can actually help you know another field I think it's it's fantastic yeah, I, yeah, because it's we all have our own sound and our cells have our own sound, you know, and it's just it's interesting. And I love that when it goes out of order, it's like, yeah. oh, you know, the moment that like all of a sudden it's out of tune yeah. and it's like hmm. just yeah, just imagine somebody who's suffering from high blood pressure and like who needs to be scanned over a period of one year, like instead of going through all the paper stuff and going through, you know, the data, you can mm -hmm. within one minute or let's say 12 minutes every month, a minute go and you're like, wow in December, you had high blood pressure. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it saves time in the end. And um, yeah, that's something like specialization in the human species is something, um, it's a good thing, but also a scary one because we get more and more specialized. And in the end, uh, we don't know any, you know, I mean, like, look, we are in front of a computer and we don't know at all how it works. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's like actually pretty scary. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, hopefully people will use it, um, you know, for the advancement in a good way. But I agree. I think, um, you know, years ago I started uh, this travel blog because I was on the road for like seven years and I called it Bohemian Babe. And the reason mm -hmm. the name of it, right, is Bohemian is a reminder to always try to think outside of the box. 
because just what you think you know and if that's all like that's in front of you you're missing out on so many other things and there's always another way to see something too and then the babe part is to always find awe like a child in the world every day you know so it's like yeah for me that is such a great reminder because like you said i mean there's so much out there and things that we aren't even experiencing that are around us you know whether it's sounds we can't hear like vibrations that we just do not hear but it doesn't mean they're not there or things in front of us that we just our eyes aren't attuned to seeing but they're there right so i love that you explore all of these different aspects and that you're curious about those things as well so let me ask you with music why do you think it impacts people the way it does wow um you know i would i would say um there's one part that's really this mysterious art form too about it um um, I mean, that's still a big debate, right? Even among scientists, like what makes you move at a certain point? And that's like, it can be very subjective um, and have personal reasons. Um, I can give you a small example, but like we all heard a song that we didn't like. And because of time passes, it reminded you of a moment. And then you actually started to like a song. So that's the most, that's the, the we come to the essence of so how something can evolve over time and can actually, um, become likable, even though it was not at first. So now this transcribed to or transposed to music itself is like an unanswerable question. I mean, like, uh, I don't remember what struck me when I was a kid. But you know, as I told you, I was like, I grew up in a musical household. Now, when I listen to Bach, it just reminds me of my father practicing in the morning. So I have a personal attachment to that. Um, and I don't know, sometimes you hear a chord that reminds you of something or tried so but then there's also this very ephemeral aspect of music too right um even though i strongly believe we should watch every art form as ephemeral like even if you go to a museum you see a painting we see we see it decay you know decay over centuries so you are just a short witness of a certain amount of the time it's there uh statues same thing i mean everything dissolves but with music we are aware of it instantaneously, you know what I mean? So uh, you go to a concert and you experienced the entire art form for its entire length, and then it's gone. So you're witness in principle of the birth and death of the art form itself, you know, because, because I mean, music per definition is the sounding art. So what I do, for example, when I write music, um, it's not, it's, it's not the art form. It's basically like, a, you know, an instruction on how to produce the sound. Um, but what I do then is not music, right? It's, so for me, it's, it, it gets even more uh, into the role between composer and interpreter, like interpretation of music. So it's even a different thing. But um, yeah, I strongly believe that the ephem ephemeral aspect, the short lived aspect of music is one of the things that draws many people to concert halls to um, maybe unconsciously but to think that um, it's unique. You know, it's like you go to a museum and you see once a painting and it's gone and then somebody imitates it the same way and it's it looks like the same, but it's not. That's why we keep recording, you know, Beethoven because it's every time it's a little bit different. That's why we keep recording uh, things. So, yeah. Okay, okay. And then let's um, let's talk a little bit about why you started recording animal sound well not recording animal sounds but listening to them to train your ear so what led you on that path and why why do you do it uh so to be honest it started all as a as a as a quarantine you know like a job i was just at home in berlin and uh i came upon a video of a dog howling and then i was just like wow that's actually interesting how the dog Owls at the same time, you know, and wants to reach that pitch he's playing on the piano. And I was just like, this is so funny. It would be actually interesting to see it in, in sheet music, you know, because he's getting close to it. And every time he, he actually makes a small glissando up to reach the note. Um, and so I transcribed it. And then I was just like, wow, that's, you know, actually, I learned quite a bit doing that. I was like, okay, the dog's range is from like their C, but it goes really high too. And, uh, 
and then I continued to, um, you know, to search for animal songs. Uh, and I then the one changing event was the a humpback whale song I stumbled up, upon. And then I, it was really a, an epiphany. Like, um, I mean, I know those, I presumably know those animals, right? And uh, suddenly I got like goosebumps all over my body. I remember like listening to that song and I was just like, wow, this is crazy. How, how come I never really focused on those songs or like those, and um, then I transcribed it. And I also started researching about the songs and the, of the animals. And then I started to learn so much again, like so, so much. Um, not about the animal in itself, but also about the, the songs and their sounds. And yeah, then I got addicted of, um, of transcribing animal sounds and it became larger, you know, then I also noticed uh, missions in that and doing that too. Like, um, you know, I noticed that nightingales spent half of the year south in countries southern of the Sahara desert. And then I was just like, wow, you know, from Uganda to West Africa and stuff. And I was just like, wow, how come I never knew that, you know, I'm in Berlin, which has the biggest population of nightingales in the summer uh, anywhere else than in, uh, in Germany. So in Berlin. And uh, then I was like, I have so many things in common already with like people um, that are, again, presumably, you know, not necessarily share much, much together in culture, like, you know, from Uganda, I don't know, but actually we have something so essentially uh, common, like, you know, night nightingales that are around us. And for me, the sound of nightingales, you know, when I, uh, all my childhood in Berlin is like, it's filled with like songs of nightingales in the summer. So yeah, there's a way to link people together too, you know, and I noticed that in comments too, people like just say like, yeah, around the, oh, this is, <laughs> I, I know that bird and somebody who is a very different place knows it too. And um, so, yeah. I love that. So you use you use these sounds to help train your ear in a certain way. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. But basically, yeah. it's uh, I call it an ear training challenge because you know, in, um, at at Juilliard in every music school, you have to um, go to solfege classes and ear training classes, which um, are uh, difficult classes. And in general, people don't like them very much. But I have to say that. Um, the classes I've been to, especially the ones at Juilliard, have been like um, amazing classes, like some of the best I've attended. And I owe my teachers there a lot, 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 lot. Um, so yeah, but basically it, it keeps also my, my ear trained, yeah. Yeah, so let me ask you, do you, when you're out in non-musical environments, right? And yeah. you're just out and you're out with your friends and they maybe aren't people that have been trained formally. Their ears haven't been trained in certain ways. Are you picking up on, do you notice other sounds that maybe they aren't paying attention to? No, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think so. But sometimes funny things happen, of course, you know, like a honk would do the exact same note as a glass that you have on the table or something. And <laughs> these are very music musician jokes you know like um or it would create an interval that is funny or you know you hear a third and be like oh that's a major third down it's like beethoven five honks sometimes you know um or a vanning machine that would do a certain noise and suddenly you know you also have a noise from the street or that an ac is the same pitch and you're just like um yeah i think everybody noticed them but among musicians it's always funny because you're like oh you know <laughs> Um, yeah, funny coincidences happen like that. Yeah. yeah, I think it would be so much fun to spend a day with you just walking around New York City when you hear <laughs> these sounds that you could say, oh, this is this, and this is, the, you know, like, I think that would be a blast yeah. for sure. So, yeah. Yeah, in um, New York City, there's there's a lot of noise to it. So, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, but for example, it's funny, like the subway in New York, when it starts, not all of them, but I think the, the latter named ones, so the larger ABC and stuff, I think when they start, they do a, a minor seventh up but up the octave and uh, it's, you know, it's like the beginning of West Side Story is somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, that's my thing. And the subway in Berlin does an octave. No read. So that's, you know, stuff like that. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I, I wish like um, 
So I think some of the things that we learned growing up, I wish that there was more focus on the art of listening, just in general. You know, I mm -hmm. think it's such a valuable tool that we have and such a gift that I really wish that it was explored a little bit more and promoted that, you know, how valuable and important just listening is, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, um, I, I had a class in Berlin too where we uh, focused on the overtone series, so all the partial tones. Whenever you play one note, you know it's not only that one note. And of course you have, you know, a tam-tam or -tam long and back, like um, you hear those overtones coming one after each other. So, and uh, we would, um, focus on listening each of those overtones and actually um, I do that with some of my students at, uh, at Juilliard too so I teach at the music advancement program um, and it's always like you know it's so obvious once you exemplify it well on the piano and then people are mind blown because you're like wow actually one note contains not only that one note but a multitude like it's an entire universe with that one note and um suddenly you listen to a note very differently. You know, suddenly you hear a piano, you can be just like, oh my God, just that one pitch. But like, I hear so many of them. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, um, that's a beautiful thing that um, suddenly, you know, to be attentive on one single note and like, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, that kind of takes me back to what we were talking about earlier. And when you were like, well, we think something's this way and there's more to it. And it, I think that correlation could be made with a note, like it's labeled this note, but there's so more, so much more to that one note, right? So yeah. when we pay attention and we really spend time getting to learn something and experiencing it and finding the essence of it, there's so much beyond what we initially think we know about it, you know? So I love that. So what are some sounds that you would say are your favorite sounds? Do you have any sounds that when you hear them, it's just like, wow. You know, it just, it moves you. Um, any sound or do you mean like animal sounds? It could be any sound, any sound. Wow. Um, uh, I think, I think when you have a string section, like a full string section, playing a triad, like a, a major triad or minor, or it doesn't really matter what kind of chord. Um, and you have a bass section that just has a pizzicato. I think this is one of the most sublime sounds there. So smooth and like just so, so beautiful. So, you know, I was playing in youth orchestras and I've been to a lot of concerts, obviously, but whenever you have those moments, just strings, chords and pianissimo and the bass, bass section that has a pizzicato. Oh my God, this is like, everybody's quiet. But it can also be like, a choir, same thing, a chorale, you know, a choir just singing, a triad, something, you know, or humming it, humming the notes, something very soft. It's just like, it's emotionally intense, like personally. Um, yeah. You know, no joke. I just felt like you describing that, it was like reliving it. And I literally felt that in my chest. Like I <laughs> yeah. felt it move in my chest. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah, that was so beautiful the way that you just relived that, you know, you could yeah. see that moment for sure. Yeah. I mean, there's there are passages and symphonies where that's, uh, that's always the moment when just like, you know, you like just, you like, let it go. Yeah, that's that's a, a good way to look at things, letting it go, right? So, um, in the future, how do you think sound will be used? Um, and it so, can be in any area. It can be when it applies to music. It can be something completely different outside of music. Just how do you? What's one way do you think sound will be used in the future? Well, my. I don't know how it's going to be in the future, but I hope that um, it will be used maybe more also for uh, in different fields, you know, sound like, um, as I said, with the um, in medicine, for example, to use sound also to help other fields. And um, you have really new fields too, like music therapy, you know, which uses sound to also help people or like, um, and I think it's such a fresh field, you know, there's still a lot to be done there. Um, but 
I think we're on the right way to use it more in interdisciplinary ways. And um, yeah, I think we'll find it more too. So I mean, when you consider everything to be sound, you know, like even like speech recorded everything, then just think about the last 20 years. I mean, you know, you can listen to music everywhere you want. Now you can, uh, um, you can hear books, uh, you can, uh, so, but as I said, also for medicine, hearing it, you can you um, music therapy. Um, yeah, and I'm sure there's many more things coming up, but uh, I can't predict the future, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's something to be said about living in the mm-hmm. present moment for sure, yeah. so, yeah. So, all right, Alexander, where can people find you if they would like to learn more about your work? Um, so I have a website, um, alexanderlieberman.com. So my name.com. And um, then I'm also on social media, on Instagram. My name is uh, Lieber Lina there. So the beginning of my last name, L-I-E-B-E-R-L-I-N-E-R, Lieber Lina. So basically a uh, Berliner. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And uh, otherwise, also on Facebook, I have a, a page. That's my name, Alexander Liebermann, composer. And... Yeah, that's it. So I'm always answering messages and uh, also taking requests for animal transcriptions. <laughs> and let me ask you on that on that note, do you have a favorite animal sound? Is there something that you've heard that you're like, wow? I mean, to be honest, they're all like, uh, I mean, the favorite by far is humpback whale songs. But after that, they're all um, pretty crazy, to be honest. And I found so many crazy things. You have no idea. Like, uh, when you, you know, when you listen to a Nightingale song, for example, it goes by so quickly and it's so intense and you have so many details to focus on noise, but also pitches, um, you know, real notes and then noise um, and all happening at once or twice um, because birds can use both their syrinxes at the same time. So you sometimes have two notes played at the same time uh, simultaneously. Um, and I found crazy things, you know, musical themes from like, famous pieces within like a, frac- a fraction of a second, um, a fraction of a second. And uh, that's always, you know, I was like, how funny is that? Or like jazz licks, really fast, really high, but then actually a jazz lick. But the craziest thing by far has been uh, the transcription of a musician ran of the Amazon forest called the Uirapuru that I've transcribed um, because I mean, the bird literally sings a samba, like the, it has a, the rhythm of a samba, you know, it's like that, 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 it's like, wow. And um, I was just like amazed, you know, like how come this bird is uh, endemic to the Amazon forest and is singing a samba, <laughs> like um, in a samba rhythm, sorry, not a samba, but in a samba rhythm. So that's, you know, um, and I'm not saying that the history of samba is resumed to this bird song, obviously not, but uh, it's still worth, you know, thinking about because a lot of cultures have credited the origins of music uh, to nature, to birds, especially like the Tuvans and the ancient Chinese. Um, so, you know, who knows, who knows really, but it's, yeah, I always like to think about it, you know, it's so funny, maybe it's, Maybe it's even, you know, both ways, but I doubt it. That the influence is both ways, but I doubt it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, one can learn a lot through listening to you know, bird songs. Awesome. And, you know, I will, I will include um, the different ways to contact you and find your work in the body of this, too. So in the text portion, the description, people can find that, too. So... But what an awesome journey today. Thank you so much for taking the time out and for sharing your time and your energy and all of your knowledge. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah, it's so good. So, so good. So, all right. Is there anything else you would like to add before we wrap up? Ah, 
I don't I don't think so. I think I think I I've said enough. <laughs> oh, it was it was wonderful. Yeah, I could I could sit here and talk to you all day and ask you a million questions, but I know um, you're visiting with family and I know that's very important time. So I want to honor your time and your energy. So we'll, we'll wrap up. But I just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything else that you wanted to add before we did so. Well, so just a big thank you to you and uh, for what you do. It's great. And uh, yeah, maybe we see each other in the in the fall then. Yeah, yeah, roommate. <laughs> we may. I mean, I'm back in the States, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when we're roommates, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. All right. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.